Hey everyone, it's been about a week since I posted a rebuttal video, so I promise to keep these uh, pretty frequent, at least weekly, if not uh, multiple times during the week I want to post rebuttal videos. It does take me a little bit longer when the rebuttal I have to do is to a video that's long, like these lectures by Pastor Mike Winger. This one's over an hour long. So in order to do a rebuttal video, it usually takes twice as long because I'm commenting, listening to what Pastor Mike says, and then offering my thoughts on it. Whenever somebody throws out an argument or an assertion, it always takes longer to debunk something than for someone just to make a claim that that lacks in support or is illogical. So I'm going to try to keep posting as much as I can. I'm not going to be able to get through the whole video in this one sitting because after today, I got to go on a lot of travel. I'm going to go speak in Indianapolis, Dana Point, California, and then in a few weeks, I'll be in Sydney, Australia. So I'll keep posting these as much as I can, but I figured why not get through as much of this as I can, then I can do you know a part two to this video. So why don't we, uh, let's jump into it right now. Let's make sure we got our volume. Well, all righty then. And here we go. Yes, there's a difference between the Roman Catholic Church and Catholics. Catholics are individuals, they have individual beliefs. They may or may not agree with the church on different areas, and they may or may not be saved depending on their personal trust in Jesus. And, uh, and so we approach them as individuals. But the Roman Catholic Church is a little bit of a different thing. It has doctrines that are specific, that are detailed, and my contention is that disagree with the Bible. Now, the foundation of this doctrine that the Catholic Church teaches is actually well, it's one particular thing. The Roman Catholic Church is based on one pillar. The whole church is built on one solid pillar that if this pillar fails, then the rest of the doctrine comes tumbling down. And that- uh, Just a side note, by the way, I'm playing this at 1.25 speed. Last time I did Pastor Mike, I did one time speed, which is too slow, and 1.5 speed was too fast. So I, I like to keep these videos as short as I can. So I think one, maybe 1 1.25 will be the sweet spot here. I think it worked with Pastor Jeff Durbin. I'm going to try it here just so you know he doesn't actually talk this fast in, in real life. But I think it's still reasonable to listen to. A pillar is the Roman Catholic Church's claim to have authority. It's the claim of the church to be able to say, we and we alone can tell you what the truth is about God. That's the claim. Because if that claim falls apart, all of a sudden now I'm holding up the Bible and going, let me make sure that what you say is what's in here. But if their claim's accurate, then I can't interpret the Bible, only they can. So it becomes a very important issue. And I would strongly recommend you check out my previous videos, especially the last video I did, because Pastor Mike's kind of rehashing some points he made in that video, such as the church does not say that only the Catholic Church can interpret the Bible and individual believers are simply not able to interpret. It's not like I read the Bible and then I send an email to the Vatican saying, hey, how should I understand what this means? Catholic biblical scholars interpret the Bible, theologians, priests interpret the Bible all the time. The Church has given us guardrails, however, to know specifically where our interpretations cannot go. This is something Pastor Mike would do with his own assembly, at his, at his own church where he's an associate pastor at. I'm sure he would say, you can reach different interpretations of the Bible, but it can't mean that Jesus isn't God. It can't mean that we don't have faith in God as a trinity. He'll definitely say, if you read the Bible, Pastor Mike will tell his audience, you cannot read the Bible and come to the conclusion that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, no matter what John 6 says. So, uh, you know, he, he will have that for uh, the people that he serves as a pastor. So the question is, which pastors, as he says, which pastors have authority and which don't? Is it pastors that have a historical pedigree going back to the apostles? Or is it someone like Pastor Mike Winger, who is part of, I'm pretty sure he's part of like a Calvary, Calvary Chapel church, uh, the church he's a pastor at, which formed out of the, out of the 1970s. So who has the historical pedigree? They are based on authority. The Bible is extra. It is not essential. Roman Catholic Church statements are what's essential. This is really important. When a Catholic theologian uses the Bible to try to prove Catholic doctrine, it's just an exercise. It's not that they think they have to. They don't believe they have to use the Bible. They're just doing that to try to convince you, to try to convince others. But the official teaching of the Catholic Church, well, the Bible's important, the Bible's valuable, but only they can interpret it. So in other words, they're the ultimate source. That's the, that's the pillar. The Bible is important and the Bible is essential. We, we both agree on that point. Where the Catholic Church and Protestants disagree is on whether the Bible is the sole source of Christian revelation, that all Christian doctrine is found only and explicitly in the Bible. We disagree about sola scriptura, and as I talked about in previous videos, sola scriptura is an unworkable, unbiblical, unhistorical doctrine. 
that the church does not simply make up doctrine out of whole cloth without disregard to the Bible or the deposit of faith. Go back to the First Vatican Council. The First Vatican Council put it this way. It said, they, previous popes, defined as doctrines to be held those things which, by God's help, they knew to be in keeping with sacred scripture and the apostolic traditions. For the Holy Spirit was promised to the successors of Saint Peter of Peter, not so that they might make by his revelation, not so they might by his revelation make known some new doctrine, which is what the, the Mormon presidency can do. The, Mor- the Mormons believe that their first president, public revelation is ongoing. Of course it is, because it was given to Joseph Smith in 1824 or 1830, depending on how you count it, 1820. Uh, Mormons believe public revelation is still ongoing in their first presidency and the leader of their church. We do not believe that as Catholics. What we do believe is that the church safeguards and expounds upon the divine revelation that it was given, and this includes the development of doctrine. So by his assistance, they might religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelation or deposit of faith transmitted by the apostles. So scripture is absolutely essential, but we just don't believe in sola scriptura because the Bible Bible doesn't teach that. And in this case, I think the emperor has no clothes. And the authority claims of the Catholic Church are really vapid. They're, they end up being very empty. And we're going to talk about that some more tonight. And uh, I'm trying to push through. The, um, the, the issues get complicated. And I hear, I mean, I, as my studies in preparation for doing this, ser- this series, I hear so much radically complicated stuff. I could literally spend, I don't know, 52 weeks talking about Catholic theology and where it differs from Protestant theology and all this sort of thing. And you could walk away at the end of the 52 weeks and you'd be like, wow, I learned a lot, but I'm still totally confused. So my goal is going to be to sort of summarize these things and sort of bring them into sort of bite-sized pieces as much as possible to simplify them. And I'm going to lose some details along the way, but I shouldn't lose any truth along the way. I'm just just kind of jump to the point, you know. So the Roman Catholic Church bases their case, according to Vatican I, which we referenced, one of the church councils, which we referenced last week, on two passages of scripture. Their case for their authority, that single pillar that holds up all the doctrine of the church. We declare it, therefore, it's true. Well, that pillar is based on two passages. One is Matthew 16. We looked at that last week and showed that whatever it does teach, it certainly does not teach that Peter was the first pope and that the keys of the kingdom equal Catholic authority. That's certainly not the case. We looked at that last week. You could look at the video from last week. And I would also recommend checking out my rebuttal that I did to that. I'll link, it's linked uh, down here in the description below if you want to check that out. But the Church's doctrine is not simply based on two Bible verses. Remember, we don't believe in Sola Scriptura. We have the historical evidence of apostolic succession and, Rome, and the primacy of the See of Peter, of the See of Rome, and then also several other Bible passages that attest to Peter's unique authority as leader in the early Church. I talk about a lot of that in my book, The Case for Catholicism. But it's true that in magisterial documents, there is an emphasis or focus on Matthew 16 or John 21. We'll talk about John 21 here. But these are not the only verses, the only source of revelation from which we derive the the doctrine of the papacy and other doctrines that are related to it. But they are important ones, and so we'll get into it here. Last week, if you would like to, um, to get into that in more detail. We also showed that the Church has not always believed this like the Catholic Church says they did. In Vatican I, it says, Matthew 16 has always been understood by the Church to, being give, to giving uh, authority and primacy to Peter above all the apostles, and that's where the papacy came from. The church has not always understood, understood this. In fact, 80% of the time, 80% of the time, the church fathers disagree with the Catholic uh, interpretation of Matthew 16. So obviously that's not a consistent belief. Now, Yeah, and that source, as I talked about in my previous video, you know, that is a source taken from a heretical Gallican priest uh, named Father Lanoy, uh, who's, uh, we don't have his research or citations to see if it's accurate. That even at the time, a converted Anglican priest, uh, I think his name is Father Luke Rivington, uh, talked about how he's just completely wrong and got that source wrong about the nature of the Church Fathers and the understanding of Matthew 16. So once again, check out my book, Case for Catholicism. But this citation is thrown out there is simply based on bad scholarship done 300 years ago that's not relevant to the debate today. And you can see more of the discussion of that uh, in last week's last week's video. Today, we're going to look at John 21 because it's the, it's the other passage. So John 21, verse 15. Now, keep in mind, they say two things. This passage is where Jesus is giving Peter primacy over all the other apostles. I'm the one in charge of the church. And the church has always believed this to be the case. So it's not a new teaching from them. It's always been the case. And everyone always, has always known it, except for a few, um, you know, perverted people who have twisted doctrine. So John 21 says this in verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast... Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, when the councils, and this is not part of the dogmatic definition of things like papal infallibility, which is what Pastor Mike is looking at in the First Vatican Council, 
when the councils talk about the historical evidence for these doctrines, they're not making the claim that every single church father articulated that John chapter 21 refers to papal primacy. Not every church father or early Christian witness wrote on these passages, or it's not necessarily something that they brought up. But those who did write on it, those who did write on it and made a point to show the relationship between this and the primacy of St. Peter, they do make this connection. That's important to point out and shows the antiquity of Catholic belief about the doctrine of the papacy. So we'll get to John 21 and then deal with some of the allegations Pastor Mike makes in regard to that. Son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to them, him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now the Catholic teaching, which I read last week to you, I won't read those long quotes again, is that in these words, feed my lambs, you know, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, that in these words, Jesus gave Peter primacy over the other apostles and basically the papacy. It exists now, Jesus institutes it, and it's in this passage. Now, the first thing you notice in this post-resurrection passage, Jesus sees Peter after his three times denying, and then he's sort of reinstituting Peter um, as, a, as a follower and as a, as, a, as, a, as a shepherd and a minister of the sheep. But what you notice is this, whatever Jesus is doing here, this says nothing about a papacy. I mean, you would never read this if you didn't know about the papacy. You'd never read the Bible and come up with that doctrine. It just would never happen. It would never occur to you. It's completely artificially, you know, foisted upon the scriptures, pushed onto the Bible. We need clear teachings, not vague implications, especially when someone's claiming to have authority over the entire world. Uh, one point, as I mentioned in my previous videos, don't give Pastor Mike a hard time about papacy, saying papacy instead of papacy. Uh, <laughs> I pronounce things differently than a lot of other people, so that's, that's not a big deal here. Second, one thing I think you should notice sometimes, this is a standard argument Pastor Mike brings out, is he'll show a text that is used in support of a particular Catholic doctrine, and he will read it, and then just say, if you were just reading this, you would never come up with this doctrine. He, this is something he does over and over again as a way to try to refute Catholic doctrines. It's kind of an argument from incredulity, just saying, well, I, I couldn't see, like, how, how does this show the papacy? You, you, if you were just reading this normally, you wouldn't get that. Well, the same thing can be said about a lot of Protestant doctrines. Uh, you could say that if you just read the Bible, uh, and you were not thinking of the doctrine that of eternal security, that you can't lose your salvation, I, I could easily say anyone reading the Bible with its clear warnings about how salvation cannot be lost, you would never just come to that. And it's true, nobody came to that until the time of John Calvin in the 16th century, because when people read the Bible, the idea that salvation could not be lost simply does not jump out of the text, because there are clear warnings that it can be lost. Or if you read 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, we talked about that in the previous video, uh, talking about how uh, all scriptures inspired, that this these two verses are used to shore up the Protestant doctrine. They, they essentially are the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura. And I can make the same argument Pastor Mike does, saying, if you just read these verses, if you were in the first century reading Paul's letter, you would never get from 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, the Bible is your sole source of authority, all revelation is found uh, explicitly and only in the Bible. Oh, and by the way, the Bible is without error, and the Bible is a specific canon of these books. The New Testament contains these 27 books and no others. You would never get that from 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. So I believe it's important, I hope Pastor Mike and others will see, that these same arguments that are used against Catholic authority can easily be inverted and turned around against Protestant authority, that sometimes when Catholics and Protestants talk about this, it's almost like, okay, well, Protestantism is the default, and if the Catholic can't prove his case, Protestantism wins. That's, that's not how it works. Who each of us has to put forward evidence for the particular authority that we cite. And as I showed in the previous video, Protestants cannot build up a consistent defense of biblical authority without borrowing something from the Catholic worldview. This passage doesn't do that for them. Jesus here is putting Peter in a shepherding position. Yes, absolutely a shepherding position. But does that make feeding the sheep and tending the lambs? That's a shepherding role. But does that make him like the ultimate apostle who's in charge of all the other apostles? No, in fact, Acts 20, 28. Well, let's, we'll jump to that in a second here. Another thing that people will notice sometimes, I think Pastor Mike's doing this, 
is that when you look at biblical citations through the papacy, Matthew 16, John 21, Luke 22, some of you will say, this, this doesn't show the papacy, it just shows that Peter had special authority. That is the doctrine of the papacy. The doctrine of the papacy is that Peter had special authority in the early church, and this authority uh, continued to be passed on to his successors. That if we believe the apostles had authority in the early church, and that this authority was passed on to their successors, the same goes for Peter. If he had special authority among the apostles, this authority is passed on to his successors. So I think some people look at these passages about the papacy and think this doesn't unless I can read in this pap- in this passage that Peter went around in special vestments and a special hat and this pope mobile and everyone called him all of these special titles and he was recognized that he is the pope then I can't believe this doctrine supports the papacy that's not what it has to say it's it has to just simply show that Peter among all of the other apostles had a special kind of authority and we see that in the other passages including here in John 21. Uh, And when you look even at Protestant scholars who comment on this passage, they see that special authority, but won't go so far to say that it includes the doctrine of the papacy, but they would disagree with Pastor Mike saying, no, this is talking about a special leadership that Peter had. So let's go, for example, to David De Silva uh, writing in his book, Introduction to the New Testament. He's a Protestant scholar, and he says of this passage, Peter is the one commissioned to tend the sheep and feed them. The beloved disciple, whom the text presents as the author of John's Gospel, is not given any specific commission or responsibility for the Church in that scene or any other. So John writes this Gospel, but he's not given the special authority. Peter, and Peter alone, is given this authority. You go to Joachim, uh, Joachim Jeremias, Jeremias the, uh, the Lutheran scholar, writing uh, an entry in uh, Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, one a standard reference work for any Christian, including many Protestants. He says, Only in John 21, 15-17, which describes Peter's appointment as a shepherd by the risen Lord, does the whole Church appear to have been in view as the sphere of activity. So what's clear here is that Peter is being given special authority, not just over a a local Church, uh, that he's given an authority, he's singled out from the other Apostles to have that special shepherding authority over not just certain regions or certain churches, but over the entire church itself. So let's let's go back and the, the, let's go back to Pastor Mike, and I'll, I'll tie that up. It talks about all of the elders in Ephesus, and all of them are told <laughs> that they're to shepherd the Church of God. All of them. Every elder is told to shepherd. In fact, I'm a pastor, and that means shepherd. That, that's what that's what my goal is. That's what my job is. I'm, I'm to tend the sheep and feed the lambs and minister to the body of Christ. So this role is a really generic role. The shepherding thing. So is this uh, Papal, this call? Is he now the chief of all the apostles? Okay, let's uh, go to Luke chapter 22. Saying that Peter is shepherd over the entire church does not mean the church has no other shepherds. Act 20, 28 refers to other priests, other bishops being shepherds over their flocks. And Peter refers to them in this way as well. So the fact that Peter is the shepherd over the universal church does not take away from the pastoral role of the other bishops, of the other apostles, and their successors. But Peter has a special role as the shepherd to to feed Jesus' sheep, to tend to his lambs, and to reinforce, and in order to do that, in order to uh, serve the universal church in this way, Peter is given this role in serving the other shepherds, so this can be accomplished. And we see this in Luke 22, when Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, and in the Greek it's you all, plural, all the apostles, but I had prayed for you, singular, Jesus only prays for Peter, because he's singled out for this special role, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. So that's Peter's role here, that there are, of course, all of the apostles and their successors are the shepherds over Christ's church, but Peter has that unique role that we see in Luke 22 and John 21 as strengthening his brethren for the flock for the entire Church of Christ. Actually, Peter never even thought of himself this way. In 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4, I'll read to you. Here's Peter writing to other church leaders. And notice he doesn't introduce himself as his eminence or his holiness or anything like that. He just simply says, The elders who are among you, I exhort who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. And here's, here's his exhortation to them. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. So they're shepherds too. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords. 
Okay, so this argument essentially says that Peter is not the Pope. He did not have special authority because he refers to himself as a as a fellow priest. Uh, Pastor Mike will go on to say, you know, he doesn't say, I as a Pope instruct you all to do this, or I as, he, as chief of the apostles, chief shepherd of the church instruct you to do this. He just says he is a fellow priest. That does That is not an argument against the papacy or Peter's role in the early church for a few reasons. First, uh, we should notice that Peter is speaking in authority to all the other shepherds. So he has a special authority to tell all of them how they ought to conduct themselves, which is indirect evidence of the special office he has in directing all of them in the early church. Second, of course, Peter is not going to give himself lofty titles. He's not going to do that because the theme of 1 Peter is humility to be humble, to be a humble servant. Just a few verses after this, Peter says to them, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So when Peter says, I, a fellow a fellow elder, presbyteroi, from which we get the word priest, he's practicing the very humility that he's telling the others that they, they should model. But in saying that he is a fellow priest, he's not taking away from his apostolic authority or his unique authority he had in the early church. St. Paul does something similar. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.6 and Romans 15.25, he describes himself as a diakonoi, or practicing diakonos, that he is, serves or is a servant, and that corresponds to the office of deacon in the early church. In Ephesians 3.8, he even says that he is least of all the saints— but that wouldn't take away the fact that he had authority as an apostle that 99% of the early church did not have. He says he's the least of all the saints, which is everyone in the early church, all Christians. He identified as saints using the term saint to mean one who is set apart from God, different from how we use the term saint today, typically in reference to canonized saints or in heaven. But saints also in the biblical sense can refer to any holy person who is baptized, part of the family of God, who is set apart by God. St. Paul said he's the least of all the saints, but that didn't take away from his role as being uh, one of the apostles and having leadership in the church that almost everybody else did not have. And finally, this same language, popes use this same language today when they talk about themselves, especially when they address other priests. So a year ago, Pope Francis gave a letter to priests to celebrate the 160th anniversary of the death of St. John Vianney. I'm pretty sure St. John Vianney is the patron saint of priests. And in that letter, Pope Francis says he addresses it to all the priests who serve me as Pope. No, he doesn't say that. He says, to my brother priests, dear brothers. And he refers to priests as his brothers uh, to indirectly say that he is a fellow priest because the Pope is a priest. The Pope is a bishop. That's who he is. He is a fellow priest among them, but given a very special role to serve them and be a servant to them, to correspond to when Jesus said in Luke 22, that people, the apostles said to Jesus, who's the greatest among us? Jesus never said, there is no greatest among you. He said, the greatest among you shall be a servant. So there will be a greatest, known not because he lords it over people, but because he serves the church of God. And that's what we'll get into here when uh, Pastor Mike takes from First Peter, when Peter says to other priests and elders, the presbyteroi, not to be domineering over their flocks. I may be a pastor and a shepherd, but I am not your boss. And hopefully that makes you happy. We don't, we don't have the kind of ministry where I tell you who you're going to marry and what car you can buy and how much money you have to tithe. That is creepy. And it is not, I am not a lord over the people of God as, as a shepherd. And neither did Peter see himself as that. Um, but being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So there is a chief shepherd. There is this one who's in charge of all the shepherds, and he, they're all accountable to him. And they'll receive their crown from this chief shepherd. Who's, who's Peter talking about? Jesus, and he is not referring to himself. He's not the chief shepherd of whose place I'm in. He doesn't say anything like that. He puts himself alongside them, fellow elder, fellow shepherd, and here, here's the chief shepherd, Jesus. So Peter's just like... Right, so Peter is exalting Jesus. He's making, he is decreasing so that Jesus may increase. That is the same lesson we see from John the Baptist. But when, when we look here, talking about, you know, when Peter says not to lord this over people, that's clearly an allusion to what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 20, that when the dispute about greatness arose, when the apostles said to Jesus, who is the greatest among us? Jesus has to correct them. When James and John want, uh, either they or their mother, they want to sit at his right and his left hand, he says, you know that the, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. 
but um, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And so then that segues into when we see the parallel in Luke chapter 22. Notice you often lose this in Bible passages because there's a header here. And so we miss that these things are connected to one another. There's the dispute about greatness. Who is the greatest? It's the one who serves. The one who serves is the one who is the greatest. Jesus says there will be a greatest. And he also says, he doesn't say that the apostles won't have any authority. He says, don't lord it over people like the Gentiles do, who are clinging to their authority. But they will have rightful authority. He talks about how you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So from that, imagine this isn't here, then Jesus turns to Simon Peter as part of this same discussion and says, uh, all you guys are ones who are going to lead, you're going to judge, the greatest among you shall be the servant, and guess what? Who's the one who's going to serve everybody? Simon, Peter. Just as I said before, Satan will try to have uh, sift you all like wheat. I prayed for Simon in particular, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. You will serve them. When you have turned again, so we go back to John chapter 21, turn from what? Jesus predicts, you're going to uh, uh, Peter, uh, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you three times deny that you know me. Jesus knows Peter will deny him. When Jesus turns from that, he's to strengthen his brethren. When does he turn from denying Jesus three times? In John chapter 21, he affirms Jesus three times, and there Jesus confers on him his authority in the early church and his role to strengthen his brethren, the other apostles. So it all fits together in this way, and just looking at it bit by bit does not take away from the foundations of the doctrine of the papacy in the primacy of Peter that we clearly see in Scripture, and even other non-Catholic scholars see in Scripture. You read J. D. Kelly's uh, History of, of Christian Doctrine, the early Christian doctrines, he says that Peter was the undisputed leader of the early church, and, and Kelly is, a, is an Anglican scholar. Right in line with all the other leaders. That's, that's how he sees himself. The one unique difference is he was a witnesser or a, um, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He actually was walking with Jesus and saw him, and they later were not. But that, of course, can't be applied to the Pope either because he has not been that, in that situation, neither have I. Now, do you know this? That they say that the church has always interpreted this passage in John 21 as referring to Peter as the Pope. But no early church writing, none, interprets this as some sort of papal proclamation to Peter. Not even one. The earliest interpretation where someone says that this is papal in John 21 is from 680 AD. Over 600 years later, then someone finally has the idea that this is papal. And who is it? Pope Agatho. A very self-serving claim for his own power to increase by tying it to this scripture. By the time of the Council of Trent in the 1500s, by the time then of Vatican I in the 1800s, I think it was 1870, all of a sudden now it's like actual Catholic infallible teaching that this has always meant that and everyone's understood it, but that's demonstrably false. Really what's happening is like three times Peter denied Jesus and three times Jesus reinstates Peter. Okay, uh, Pope St. Agatha in 680, I can beat that by over 400 years. Uh, go to the writings of St. Cyprian of Carthage. St. Cyprian of Carthage, he talks about an easy proof for the faith. He says there is easy proof for the Catholic faith and its unity and its apostolicity. And he says there's an easy proof, Matthew 16, and then John 21 is his proof. Because to the same Peter, Jesus says after his resurrection, feed my sheep. And although to all the apostles after his resurrection, he gives an equal power, yet that Jesus might set forth a unity in the church, he arranged by his own divine authority the origin of that unity as beginning from one. So that's just not the case, that it's that understanding John 21 was seen as an evidence of papal primacy was not seen uh, as only in the seventh century onwards. We can go back to St. Cyprian of Carthage, even before, which is long before the Council of Nicaea and Constantine, and is part of the anti-Nicene church, the, the, some of the earliest church fathers. And there's more details there. There's a lot more in the passage, but that's the context. Um, Peter did not claim to be the Pope. He's not treated as the Pope. He didn't wield the power of the papacy. If Peter wasn't the Pope, how can his successor be the Pope? If Peter's not the Pope, nobody is. There is no Pope. It's important for, that the Catholic Church ties their authority to, to Peter. It's, I mean, they have to tie it to something. And so they tie it to Peter. It's important to make that connection. But even in the book of Acts, chapter 15, we get this council, the first council of the church. They gather together to deal with the issue about should the Gentiles observe Old Testament laws about dietary restrictions and should they be circumcised, all that kind of stuff. 
The council decides against this and they say, no, 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 this is not the gospel that's been revealed to us and yada, yada, and they send a letter out. But what's really interesting is to notice this. This council is in Jerusalem, which is where Peter is. He's in Jerusalem. Peter speaks at the council and he proclaims, hey guys, remember when I went and I went to the centurions, or I went to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and this and that. Obviously, he doesn't need them to get circumcised to be saved. He filled them with the spirit before they were ever circumcised. And so he speaks up. But then the one who makes a decision is James. Peter's there, but James is the one in Acts 15 who makes a decision and says, I judge thus. And then he says, we'll write a letter, we'll do this, such and such, and then that's what happens, that's what's done. So Peter, while he has a, certainly a very important role, and he certainly was a mouthpiece in a lot of cases, he seemed to be the public speaker, um, partially because he was just impetuous and would talk a lot. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Acts 15 and whether this provides evidence that Peter did not have a special authority and primacy in the early church. So... Acts 15, in verse 7 of Acts 15, it tells us that after there had been much debate about the nature of the inclusion of the Gentiles in the church, Peter rose and addressed the assembly. In that same verse, he recounted how God made choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So Pastor Mike kind of quickly rattled off what how Peter recounted how God gave Peter divine revelation to communicate to all the others. So here at the council, we see that Peter is giving a dogmatic declaration. He gives something that is a dogma, an unchanging, infallibly defined teaching of the church related to the inclusion of the Gentiles. This is that the gospel is not meant for Jews alone. It's meant for everyone to be part of one universal church. Now, James, who was the local bishop in Jerusalem, he concluded the council with a pastoral proposal that he said that I, I have decided thus that it would be good for Christians to abstain from blood and from meat sacrificed to idols. You don't want to cause scandal with other uh, Jewish Christians. So if there are Gentiles who eat meats, who are used to eating meat sacrificed to idols, we don't want to cause scandal to our Jewish brothers and sisters. So as a pastoral proposal, we're going to say Christians cannot eat meat sacrificed to idols. So while Peter gave a dogmatic, unchanging definition of the faith, a uh, dogma, uh, James gave a pastoral proposal or a discipline that can change. And we know that it changed because just a few years later, St. Paul allowed the Christians in Corinth to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. So Acts 15, what we see here is that Peter ended the debate about the issue at hand by revealing divine revelation in an infallible way, and James proposed a pastoral proposal that St. Paul later amended. So Acts 15, rather than showing that Peter did not have special authority, actually reinforces the special authority that he did have at that council and at the early church. As you'll, you'll see in scripture, he just kind of, a big mouth Peter, some people call him that. I would not use such a, a slur against Peter. I think Peter's an awesome guy. I think he's an amazing man. I'd love to just sit and just listen to the guy talk and teach and just be around him. I think he's amazing, amazing just to be able to be like that. If I could be around all the apostles, I don't think I'd say anything. I'd just sit there and be like, you guys talk. I'm just going to listen. You know, just, I would love it. I mean, amazing guy, amazing guy. But he's not seen as the leader of the church universal in the book of Acts, even years later. So, so yeah, when all else fails... When the Bible doesn't teach the papacy, when the Bible doesn't teach certain peculiar Roman Catholic doctrines, although there's many good Roman Catholic doctrines, I mean the Trinity and the, the, the respect towards the Word of God and the, the belief in so many different things, um, so much of the teaching about salvation is accurate and right. So much is good. But where they deviate what's uniquely Roman Catholic, that stuff, when you can't find it in the Bible, when, when you can't find it in the Scripture and you can't teach it with the Bible, you run to the early church fathers. And that's what you Oh, I also want to make sure I get here. Let's see. I think I have... Oh, some other verses. By the way, when it comes to Peter's authority in the early church, you know, uh, Pastor Mike's saying, well, Peter is just loudmouth Peter, and that's why he shows up so much. Uh, he didn't have a special authority in the church. Maybe he just talked a bunch, and that's why his name is mentioned so much. That's not the case. We see even more evidence for Peter's primacy and his authority in the church. Here's an example. In 1 Corinthians 1.12, Paul has to deal with factions in Corinth that are loyal to different people, and he talks about it in ascending order. He says people, you know, you say you're loyal to Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or Peter, or Jesus, I belong to Jesus. He's dealing with these, these factions, and some of these factions claimed Peter for themselves, the ones that they were loyal to. He was talking about Paul, Apollos, Peter, Christ. Now, you know, we see that, notice that there's an ascending order there. And that's not just, you'll say, well, that just, that's, it seems that way. That's just a coincidence in 1 Corinthians 1.12. No, that's not the case. 
Paul uses a similar ascending order to talk about Peter and separates him from the other apostles later on in his letter to the Corinthians. He says in 1 Corinthians 9.5, he talks about the apostolic right to have sister wives, to have, this is probably related to female attendants to accompany them on mission trips. And so he says, why wouldn't I have that right? The same right as all the other apostles, or the brethren of the Lord, or Peter, so it's interesting, it doesn't just say in 1 Corinthians 9.5, the apostles and the brethren of the Lord, because Peter's just one of the apostles. He says here very clearly, he says they're the apostles, they're the brethren of the Lord, even Cephas, Kephas himself. So Peter is singled out here as part of ascendant authority of note among the other apostles. He's singled out from them, which shows that he had a special primacy among them. Even in Galatians chapter 2, where Paul stands up to Peter's authority, saying that Peter wasn't living up to his own teaching in Galatians chapter 2, that shows Peter's authority, because Paul was saying that the gospel he received did not come from men, he's not trying to please human beings, and as proof he wasn't trying to please human beings, Paul is willing to stand up to the human being who has the most authority in the early church. I'm not trying to please people. Look, I even stood up to the guy that everybody else looks up to, to Peter himself. So when all of this is put together, it's very, very clear. Peter had a special authority and leadership in the early church, and the writings of the church fathers confirm that that authority was passed on to his successors so that they could maintain unity in the church amongst the other bishops and shepherds of the church that Christ founded. What you do? You go to other people, find another source so I can support my doctrine. When all else fails, they will fall on the early church fathers, and they'll say it was always known to be this way, and you need to know why they do this. Catholic. Well, it's kind of like how pr this idea, no, we look to the fathers as evidence for the antiquity of our faith. They're important witnesses of the faith. Protestants do the same thing, by the way. You know, he's saying, you, you can't find it in Scripture, so you run to the fathers. Well, okay, well, well, Pastor Mike, how do I know what the canon of Scripture is? How do I know the canon we have today is the one that God wants us to have? How do we know that these are the inspired words of God? Well, and what a lot of people say is, well, the Church gave it to us. It's not infallible, but the Church preserved this, and the Church recognized in the early first centuries that these are the, this is the inspired Word of God. So the Church recognized this in the early first centuries. So now you're just appealing to the Fathers as a group, saying they recognize something that's extremely important to you, the canon of Scripture, that itself is not found in the Bible. So don't criticize Catholics for trying to find uh, apostolic traditions that are witnessed to in the writings of the Fathers, when you do the same thing for doctrines that are not found in Scripture as well, like the very canon of Scripture itself. Theologians run to the early church fathers plainly because the Bible does not support their teachings. That's why. I have to find another source for the belief that Mary was a perpetual virgin because the Bible doesn't support that. It says Jesus had brothers. And they go, oh, well, brothers there mean such and such, but it, it just means brothers. I have to find another source to say that priests can't be married. Okay, uh, let's talk about the brothers of the Lord. I would have enjoyed more from this from Pastor Mike than just kind of a passing reference, because there's a lot to talk about. Yes, the Bible talks about the Adelphoi of the Lord, the brethren of the Lord. Uh, but what does what does that mean? mean? The meaning of the Greek word Adelpho. So the Greek translation of the Old Testament that we call the Septuagint uses the Greek word Adelphoi. It can refer to more than just blood brothers. So in Hebrew, there is no word for cousin. There's no word for nephew or niece. You have to use workarounds like the son of my brother, the, you know, the daughter of my sister. Uh, you know, there, there's no word for that in Hebrew. And so speakers of Hebrew, people who speak Hebrew and Greek, uh, they will use the same Hebrewisms in their own Greek writings. If, you, if you're bilingual, you do the same thing. I know people who are fluent in Spanish and English, and sometimes they speak Spanglish, which is kind of a mashup of the two. So in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, the Septuagint, it uses the Greek word adelphoi, which Pastor Mike says just means blood brother, having the same biological mother and father, to refer to the relationship between Abram and Lot, who were uncle and nephew. Uh, Lot was uh, uh, Abram's nephew, not his brother. Uh, the book Tobit, uh, so the deuterocanonical book of Tobit, it talks about how the relationship between Raguel and Tobit, their cousins, it uses the Greek word for cousin, anepsios, but it also uses the Greek word adelphoi, brother. So it uses brother and cousin interchangeably because adelphoi could mean 
an extended relationship that was not a blood brother. You say, well, well, that's the Old Testament, intertestamental literature. Well, if we go to the New Testament, the word for sister, Adelphi, in John 19, 25, it says, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas. Well, who is Mary, the wife of Clopas? Is she Mary's biological sister? Richard Bauckham, who is a Protestant scholar, he says that the word Adelphi, sister, so the same as brother, Adelphoi, Adelpho, I should say, need not mean full sister. The two Marys could be half-sisters, stepsisters, sisters-in-law. So Pastor Mike is just simply wrong. The Greek word Adelphoi, Adelpho, Adelphi, brother, sister, it doesn't necessarily mean blood brother. It could mean an extended kin. They could be Jesus's cousins. They could be his step-siblings from Joseph's previous marriage. The word does not require that they be blood brothers and thus contradict the dogma of Mary's perpetual virginity. The only time the Bible in the New Testament mentions an idea of people not being married, it, it calls it a doctrine of demons forbidding people to get married. And then they'll go on and have doctrines that the priest cannot get married and it has not borne very good fruit in those lives. It's a wonderful choice if someone makes to be single for the Lord, if they make that choice. But I probably wouldn't be before you right now as a pastor if someone told me that I had to, you know, I was forbidden to be married if I wanted to serve the Lord in this capacity. Well, the Bible does not... Okay, well, let's talk about celibacy now. First, the church doesn't force anyone to be celibate, because it doesn't force anybody to be a priest. Uh, by the way, celibacy, of course, is a discipline in the church. It's something that can change. It's a discipline in the Latin rite of the church, though in the Eastern rites, in the Eastern Catholic churches, priests are allowed to marry uh, before they are ordained, uh, but they cannot be raised to the level of a bishop. So there are married priests in the Eastern Church. There are married Anglican priests who are admitted on special exceptions to uh, the Western rites of the Church. Uh, so it, it is a discipline, but no one is is forced to be married. That what Paul is talking about, those who say that marriage is a that who forbid marriage that he calls a doctrine of demons, those were the Gnostics who said that all things of the flesh and the world are evil. And so they forbade marriage itself to anyone. But the Bible speaks about celibacy in, in amenable terms. Uh, Paul prays celibacy, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He said, I wish that all could be like me. He says that the unmarried man is anxious for things of the Lord. He also mentions people who broke vows of celibacy and incurred a punishment. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, which is where we get the Paul rebuking those who say merit for who forbid marriage as preaching a doctrine of demons in his letter to Timothy, Paul goes on to forbid marriage to people. He says of young widows who, when they grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry. And so they incur condemnation for having violated their first pledge. Now, in his letter to the Romans, I think it's Romans chapter 7, Paul says that if a, a wife's husband dies, she is freed from the marriage bond and can remarry without being an adulteress. So he doesn't condemn remarriage after the death of a spouse, but he does say some widows can't remarry if they made a pledge, their first pledge, if they pledged to not get married again, which was uh, some kind of a vow of celibacy in order to serve the Lord, that Paul recognizes that if you break that vow, you incur a condemnation. So celibacy is not just a discipline, it has apostolic roots itself. So what's ironic here is that this is not even something that, that's just completely non-biblical itself that's, that's brought up. There are biblical roots here, they're just being glossed over because of a, of a particular Protestant tradition that you find in a lot of Protestant churches where single men are not allowed to be pastors. There's a lot of congregations and boards who will not select someone to be a pastor of their church if he's not married. They consider him unreliable or, or you know, not competent to be a pastor, and they rigidly interpret things. So what's weird is it's almost like some Protestant churches have a tradition. It's kind of the uh, reverse celibacy rule, that you, you can't be celibate if you want to be a pastor in our church, which is a tradition of men that, that they have adopted for themselves. Not support those uniquely Roman Catholic doctrines. And I'm going to give you, um, in case you're talking to a Catholic person or maybe you're coming across Catholic theology, and then they run to the early church fathers and they begin quoting things that you're like, what are you talking about? I can't even pronounce that guy's name, let alone know what you're talking about when you quote him. I'm going to give you four reasons why running to the church fathers does not help the Vatican's cause. Four reasons, okay? One, church fathers are not the fathers of the church. It's a fancy name to be called a church father, but when you show up hundreds of years after Jesus, you are not a father of the church. Like when the, when the, when, when the thing you fathered existed before you, you're not its father. Does that make sense? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this should be easy to understand. Church fathers can be any time as late as the 8th century AD. 
So it'll say, the church father so-and-so, and the guy may, may be writing in 750 AD, 620 AD. Of course, that's the minority of the fathers. You have to have a cutoff date somewhere to show where the origins of the apostolic church have waned and we take over to the medieval church. But most of the time when we're referencing church fathers, uh, they are either giants of the faith that even Protestants have respect for, like St. Augustine, for example, or, or St. Jerome, uh, who are people who are writing in the uh, 4th and 5th centuries, or a lot of times it's the anti-Nicene fathers. It was those who, you can go back even further, those who have connections to the apostles themselves. You have the writings of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who had a connection to Peter, the writings of St. Polycarp, who was a disciple of St. John, that you have Papias of Hierapolis, the fragments of his writings. He, he spoke with people who knew the apostles themselves. So when we say they're the fathers of the church, we don't mean that they created the church, not in a literal sense like that. What we do mean is that they are important witnesses for how the faith is to be lived out, because the Bible presents us an incomplete picture about how to live the faith out. I, I would ask Pastor Mike, where does the Bible give us instructions on baptism? Where does the Bible say, this is how you shall baptize people? The closest we have is Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus gives us the Trinitarian baptismal formula. But after that, I'm sure Pastor Mike would agree, he gets in a headache when he talks to Oneness Pentecostals who say, you need to baptize in the name of Jesus, because that's what we read in the Acts of the Apostles. You'll say, well, that's not an instruction. That's a, a reference to being Jesus' baptism, not John's baptism. So I ask Pastor Mike, where does the Bible give us directions about baptism, how to perform baptism, what the formula is to be used? Uh, whether it's, does it have to be immersion? Can it be sprinkling? Can it be dunking? Uh, do people have to get married? Does the church recognize marriages? Is it the role of the church to recognize a marriage? Or do people contract marriages with one another apart from the church's authority? The Bible doesn't say. So in order to live it out, we look to the early church to see how was the faith received and understood, and that is the indispensable role of the church fathers who share with us when they talk about things like baptism, even someone like William Webster, who is extremely critical of the Catholic faith, admits that the Church Fathers uniformly agreed that baptism was a sacrament of regeneration, and baptism was necessary to enter into heaven. It was the normal and ordinary means of salvation that was provided to the Church. So the, the Church Fathers unanimously believed John 3, 5 referred to baptism. You can't be born into the kingdom of heaven unless you're born of water and spirit, which is baptism. And the Church Fathers are unanimous on that. So even when the Fathers are unanimous, many Protestants say, well, that doesn't matter because it's, it's not in the Bible. It's, it's amazing. We're going to ignore what they have received from the apostles so close to them when we're removed so far, thinking that our interpre interpretation of Scripture is better than their, in some cases, unanimous testimony? Boggles the mind. This is way, way, way long after. The book of Acts records the early church, not the church fathers. I don't like using the term church fathers, but because it's used so much, I feel like I don't have much of a choice. If I'm going to talk about these guys, I'll just use the accepted vernacular, but, but they're not the fathers of the church. That, that immediately strips away so much of this, like, of the power behind what they say when you realize they didn't start the church, they didn't plant the church, they came and inherited, you know, ministries and then made statements, and we need to look back further. We need to go to the scriptures, and if you want to see the early church, the actual early church, it's not in 300 AD, it's in 50 AD, it's in 40 AD, it's in the book of Acts, chapter 5, and chapter 10, and chapter 15, and chapter 2. Chapter 30. Just kidding, there's no chapter 30. I'm just, just testing you. So does that mean the early church did not have the Gospel of John? Does that mean that the early church didn't have the letter of Jude, the book of Revelation? Uh, well, actually, if you're looking at 40 and 50 AD, the early church had no Bible. It had no New Testament. Now that you know, the, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians were written in the mid-50s. It had creeds that were being established and circulated. Paul hands on one of those creeds in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But, okay, well, then never mind. I mean, obviously, we'll look at 80, 90 AD. Okay, that's the early church. Uh, but what about the church in, um, that means in Ephesus and Rome and other places far from Jerusalem, they wouldn't have had all of the Gospels. They wouldn't have all of the writings circulated to them by then. Okay, well, let's look at the mid, uh, you know, the, the mid century to see what the, even to see what the church looks like, we have to go forward in time from the 40s and 50s to at least by, let's say, the mid year 150 to say that the, the memoirs of the apostles had circulated throughout the church, so we have the Gospels and the New Testament documents, even though we have no list of the canon of Scripture at that time, because no one had thought, you know, that was not a part of the understanding of the early church. The early church kept the teachings and, pre and preachings of the apostles, the apostolic faith that was communicated by the bishops. 
that was the faith, not a particular set of books that dictated the faith. Because you look in the writings of, of the early church prior to the mid-2nd century, there is no articulation of a canon of Scripture. There's an articulation of, as St. Ignatius of Antioch says in 110 AD, to follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father. So here, once we get to the earliest enough church that has all the New Testament documents, which Pastor Mike would say, yeah, they got to have the New Testament documents, that's the early church, we also get Justin Martyr's description of the Mass, and St. Ignatius of Antioch, both of them describing partaking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, which is really and truly the flesh of our Savior, so a belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, uh, among these fathers who have an intimate connection to the Apostles, just removed by one or two generations. But also, I wonder with Pastor Mike, is, is he a, a restorationist almost? Because he's saying, like, we don't, we don't need the Church Fathers. It makes it seem like what they wrote, if that doesn't matter, that the teaching of the New Testament was just lost after, like, 80 AD or 90 AD. It was just gone. And then when was it rediscovered? Was it Martin Luther? Later on, he'll say he's not a Lutheran. He disagrees a lot there. So it seems like, from his perspective, the teaching of the Church was lost in uh, 80 AD, seven, let's say 70 AD, and it was discovered 1900 years later when Calvary Chapel formed in the 1970s. I don't know. That's sounding almost like what the Mormons say when they say that the Church of Christ was lost after the death of the Apostles, and it was just gone, and then it just reappeared in 1830 with, with Joseph Smith. The reason they look to the Fathers is because they cannot find their teachings in the Bible. But someone who speaks 300 or 700 years after Jesus... In, I have no reason to think they're an authority. I just have no reason. So I don't really want to battle church father with church father with church father. Well, Pastor Mike, you're speaking 2,000 years after Jesus. Why would you be an authority? I'm sure he would say, well, I'm not the authority. The Bible's the authority. And if I said, well, Pastor Mike, when I read the Bible, I see these Catholic doctrines. Oh, no, 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 they don't mean that. Well, Pastor Mike, why would I trust your authority to interpret this to say that I'm getting it wrong? See, I, I, the, the argument cuts both ways there. Church Father, I want to go to the scriptures and say, show me here. And that's what the Reformation did when they said, sola scriptura, like only the Bible. You show it to me in the Bible, and I'll believe it. And that is certainly my position today. But the the vague passages that were brought to from Catholic theologians that, that to teach things like the papacy and stuff like that um, are certainly not sufficient. The second reason why you can't trust um, the Church Fathers, or I should say specifically, not that you can't trust them, that please don't quote me on that. Uh, some of them have great things to say, that's for sure. But the second reason why you cannot trust the Vatican's rendition of the Church Fathers is because of something I heard, I've heard one theologian call Peterism, which I thought was a, was a fun term. <laughs> Peterism, which is this idea that a Catholic apologist will often quote Church Fathers to support the idea that Peter was the first Pope, right? But what they'll do is they'll take the quote out of context, and basically if this, if this guy said anything nice about Peter, then Peter's the first Pope. So they'll be like, Peter, who was, who was of note among the apostles, like that phrase right there, boom, that's the papacy, that proves it. He said he was of note. So that it's a sort of like a vague reference to Peter or anything nice about Peter or that Peter carried the gospel to the Gentiles and was the first one to preach to the Gentiles and they received the Spirit. And you're like, therefore he's the Pope. And I'm like, hold on a second here. Like one thing does not lead to the other. And this is, this is what happens is this Peterism. Now, the problem with Peterism is that you're editing the fathers. You're sort of selectively pulling some things they said. And then the same father might have said something totally against the papacy and they'll just ignore that part. So it's just a very selective, edited version of the church fathers, um, who also are not the fathers of the church. The third issue is this. What's funny is, okay, so there are some Catholics who will uh, take very weak illusions and draw doctrines out of them when they shouldn't. Okay, then let's just go to the strongest arguments. What's funny is Protestant apologists do the same thing when they read the fathers to try to find their doctrines. Uh, you know, where is sola scriptura? Where is sola fide? In the history of the church, is it really the case that God allowed the church to not know these doctrines for 1,500 years until the Protestant Reformation? And we were just clueless until Martin Luther and Calvin figured this out? So what some Protestants will do is they'll go back to the Fathers, and they'll search anywhere. So not Peter syndrome, but it's like Scripture syndrome, Sola Scriptura syndrome. They'll say, oh, see, this Father said that Scripture uh, is, is a light to us, to always guide us, or that this Father said Scripture is sufficient. Oh, okay, well, that, that's Sola Scriptura. This father said, St. Athanasius said Scripture is sufficient. Yeah, there are fathers who believe Scripture was materially sufficient in the sense that what we need to know to be saved is found there, in the same way that everything I know to build a house is at Home Depot. Home Depot is sufficient for me to build a shed, for example. But guess what? If I go to Home Depot, I can't build a shed. 
because I don't know how to do it. I'd be terrible at it. I need instructions. I need a guide. I need someone who knows what they're doing to show me how to assemble all the pieces together. Home Depot is not sufficient in that way for me. It's not formally sufficient. Much the same way the church fathers like Athanasius, Basil the Great, will say, yeah, every, what you need to know to be saved is in Scripture, but the way to put it all together to know how to be saved, to get a full system of theology, that is not there in Scripture. And so they would deny that Scripture is formally sufficient or it's the only authority you need. Athanasius is very clear that he talked about his own Trinitarian doxology, other elements of the faith are traditions handed on by the apostles that are not explicitly found in Scripture. So this idea of Peter syndrome, Protestants do it too, with the Church Fathers on Sola Scriptura when they try to turn the Fathers into defenders of Sola Scriptura, and I've seen this happen. I've got, let's see, there's, where's the, uh, here, let's see, I'll, I'll grab it. Uh, oh, I knocked something, I knocked my mic. I mean, like here in this older anthology of um, Sola Scriptura, there's an entry in here that, that does that, so I'll have to do a whole, I'll have to do a whole video on that, but we'll go on, so. There's contradictions and inconsistencies among the people they're quoting to support Catholic doctrine. The Church Fathers do not like hold arms and stand together, saying together, you know, purgatory, Mariology, th these things are not there. The Rosary, like these things, they're, they're not standing together preaching Roman Catholicism. It's just not accurate. Well, of course, the Rosary is a particular devotion that developed in the Middle Ages. Uh, but just because the Church Fathers did not pray a certain way, that doesn't mean we can't pray that way. Nobody prayed the the Jesus prayer, dear Jesus, please accept me as your personal Lord and Savior. Nobody prayed that before the 20th century, 19th century at best. I think it's a 20th century prayer. It doesn't mean you can't pray it. You can. But it's definitely unknown in the, the history of the Church. When it comes to those other doctrines, some fathers don't write on doctrines, just the same as some Protestant teachers today won't touch on every single thing that Protestants believe. Just some fathers don't touch on a subject. Others do. As we'll see later, some fathers do hold views that are at variance with the other fathers. They're not unanimous. They're human beings. They're fallible. But they agree far more than they disagree on important issues. And even the fathers who do disagree, like who deny papal primacy, will see this, for example, with Tertullian, uh, or fathers who disagree like when Origen uh, disagrees. You cite them. Well, Tertullian and Origen are not church fathers uh, in, in the strictest sense of that word. They're ecclesial writers uh, in the sense that they're not saints, not St. Saint Tertullian, not St. Origen, because they died— uh, out of communion with the Church because they had embraced particular heresies. Uh, but when you look among the Fathers, they agree far more than they disagree, and you see a proper trajectory and development of Catholic doctrine among them. Way more than you—you you won't find Protest, modern Protestant doctrines like sola scriptura or sola fide, or that you can't lose your salvation, uh, or a rejection of baptismal regeneration or a rejection of the Eucharist as being Christ truly present. You will not find that in the early, in the early Church Fathers. But because there's so many church fathers and the volumes and volumes you have to read, it's just so intimidating that nobody's going to go double check it. So they just go, okay, that's you're like, you're just talking over my head at this point. Just an example, last week, I already did this with you, so I'll, I'll spare you the time. But last week, Matthew 16, the Catholic Church says, hey, everyone's always agreed that this passage is about Peter getting the keys of the king, the kingdom, and Peter is the rock in the passage. But yet, 80% of the time, 80, the church fathers disagree. So they don't stand together saying Roman Catholic theology. <coughs> Not only that, um, we, already, we already talked about how that's from a, a bad, you know, a source 300 years ago that's, that's not reliable, so just keep that in mind. They actually say things a lot of the time that come directly against Roman Catholicism. Clement, one of them, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians, and he wrote that there were a multiplicity of elders. There was a bunch of elders in Rome, and it was individual sort of groups of, of believers with their own eldership independently running. There was no bishop of Rome the whole place. There was no pope at the time. That's how Clement puts it. Tertullian... Okay, let's talk about Clement of Rome. Uh, that letter written somewhere between 60 AD to 96 AD, written by Clement, either when he was the Bishop of Rome, that he would be the fourth Bishop of Rome, the third successor to St. Peter, either when he was Bishop of Rome, or Clement may have been writing the letter of Clement when he was a corresponding secretary, when he was part of the elders who presided at Rome, uh, but he was a corresponding secretary that wrote on their behalf, including for the Bishop of Rome. Uh, so there's different ways that we can look at this. Clement, the letter of Clement does not say, there was no bishop at Rome, or there is no pope at Rome. That's not the case. The letter of Clement talks about how Clement is intervening on behalf of the church at Rome for a dispute in Corinth about elders who had been deposed. And so what's interesting is that when the letter of Clement 
is being written at this time, when, it, when it's being written, the Apostle John is still alive. The Apostle John is still alive, and he could intervene. He's near Corinth. He's in Ephesus. And yet the Corinthians don't go to him. They go to the Bishop of Rome. They go to Rome to have this dispute adjudicated, essentially. And so Clement intervenes on behalf of the elders who have been deposed. So here he is. So Clement is intervening in a dispute hundreds of miles away from Rome. Uh, talking about, actually, in the letter of Clement, talks about how there will be severe consequences if they do not listen to the advice that is being given in this particular letter. So here, if Clement is the Bishop of Rome in writing, he's using plural language. So some, so some people say, well, this is when Clement was a corresponding secretary writing on behalf of the Church of Rome as a whole, which would include the Bishop of Rome at that time, to give a directive. Uh, but if Clement was the Bishop of Rome... I think what Pastor Mike's latching onto is here is that the letter of Clement uses the plural, we ask you to do this, we want you to do that, saying, oh, he's not writing I from his singular authority as bishop. Well, popes all the way up into the early 20th century frequently wrote with the magisterial we. So they used the plural we to talk about themselves and the office of the papacy in general, kind of what we would call the magisterial or plural we. This is something that popes have done all the way up into the 20th century. So either one, it would, it would be surprising to see that Rome did not have a bishop when at around that same time, St. Ignatius of Antioch was writing his letters to the to the church at Rome, to the church at Ephesus, to the Smyrnians, uh, to the Tralians. And when Ignatius is writing to all these churches, he talks about how there by this time in 110 AD, there is a monarchical episcopate. There is one bishop. He talks about how follow the bishop of your church, where it is presiding. So he's talking about how cities have a singular bishop. And so it would be very surprising if Rome did not have this at this time. And other ways of understanding what Clement means by using this plural language makes sense, either writing on behalf of the entire Roman church, the bishops and the elders there as a corresponding secretary, or he's writing as bishop, but using kind of the plural we that popes have used all the way up into the early 20th century. He's the first person to ever use the phrase Bishop of Bishops or Pontifex Maximus, and these are titles of the Pope. He's the first person to use them. This was in the early third century, right? But here's the interesting thing. Tertullian was using them to insult the Bishop of Rome. And he said, Bishop of Bishops, Pontifex Maximus, as an insult, like tongue in cheek, I'm insulting you, because he was upset that this person was seeming to claim to have more authority than they deserved. And so he uses the, frame bishop of, the phrase Bishop of Bishops. He also says, like I said, Pontifex Maximus. That was a Roman pagan high priest name. And he's trying to say, see, you're doing what that guy does. That's totally pagan. That's not Christian, you Pontifex Maximus. That'd be like I was saying, oh, you're like President Monson or something like that. Like I name you, you know, after some sort of cultish leader. And that's what he did. Now, later, these became titles of the Pope. But certainly this church father doesn't agree. Okay, so let's talk about Tert Tertullian. Remember what I said that we don't call him Saint Tertullian because... He fell out of communion with the church, and he later became a heretic following Montanus and the Montanus prophecy heresy, kind of similar to modern charismatic movements that believe the Spirit is still speaking and follow that, even in contradiction to what the Bible says. So let's talk about Tertullian then. First, when Tertullian was faithful to the Catholic Church, faithful to the papacy before he became a heretic, he said that the city of Rome, that the Roman church holds the apostolic thrones. And he said specifically of St. Peter, Peter is called the rock on which the church should be built, who also obtained the keys of the kingdom of heaven with the power of loosing and binding in heaven and on earth. He then goes on to say, well, sorry, he doesn't go on to say, I go on to say that Tertullian became a Montanist heretic. And so he believed that authority lied to whoever had the spirit of God, not necessarily with the apostles. And so it's here where he gets into this sneering and this critique of the Pope. But when Tertullian does that, this is the early 3rd century, by the way. So later on, Pastor Mike will say that the papacy didn't come into existence until like 590 AD, this idea of a Pope with universal jurisdiction over the entire church. That's not until like the 6th century. In the early 3rd century, Tertullian, writing about Pope Calix uh, Callistus, he says, I, this is when he's a heretic. I hear that there has even been an edict sent forth, and a preemptory one too, the Pontifex Maximus, the Bishop of Bishops, issues an edict. And this is sneering. Pontifex Maximus was not a term people used for the Pope because it was the term for the imperial ruler of the Roman Empire. It was a pagan title. You wouldn't use it for the Pope, for uh, the Bishop of Rome. 
It was used for the Roman emperor instead. But notice here that Tertullian is indirectly admitting that the Pope at this time in the early third century claimed a kind of universal authority uh, over the church, that he claimed this authority. He didn't just think of himself as just one bishop among many. He had authority to be able to excommunicate people, to resolve disputes among churches, among various churches throughout the, the, the empire, throughout the Christian world. And so Tertullian is sneering this, but in doing so, he indirectly testifies to the Pope's authority, to the Bishop of Rome having this particular authority. And then later on, the title Pontifus Maximus, after the Roman Empire became Christianized in the 4th century, which is after uh, Emperor Julian made Christianity the, the official religion of the Roman Empire, then the title Pontifus Maximus was attributed to the Pope. So usually the emperor is the one who attributed this. It was more of a legal term. It wasn't something the popes adopted for themselves. They preferred more humble titles like uh, the servant of the servant of God for example. So uh, I think that's as far as, as I want to get to today. Let's see, do I have anything else there? Well, we'll, we'll get to St. Cyprian here in the next video, because we're going about an hour, and I have to head out soon to, to go on a trip to go speaking. And But I wanted to get you guys a video, and this is already an hour, so it's probably going to take me three hours to get through Pastor Mike Winger's one-hour lecture, but that's okay. We're learning a lot along the way. Um, hopefully Pastor Mike and I can have a dialogue or a debate after this. I think that would be fruitful. I, I have a policy. I really don't like doing rebuttal to rebuttal videos. I do one rebuttal. Someone puts something, I rebut. After that, I don't do counter rebuttals. I'm happy to do a public dialogue or public debate to kind of tie everything together. So maybe we'll be able to do that. You never know. Uh, so I will continue the video. My gosh, we didn't even get a third of the way through, but we will finish it. We will get there. I promise you, as Maya Diamond Joe Quimby, <laughs> we will get there. So, uh, But to help us get there, we need your support so we can keep making videos like these. I want to make lots of videos like these. And if you want to help me make videos like these, I really hope that you will go to trendhornpodcast.com. For as little as $5 a month, you get access to, to bonus content. Uh, I think actually right now, the next bonus content I have is I got to do an interview with uh, Gary Sinise, the actor from Forrest Gump and Apollo 13, uh, and also you know Lieutenant Diane. Uh, that's going to be coming up here soon, guys. Uh, I'm going to release that interview here on YouTube and in my podcast. But if you want a sneak peek, if you're a patron, you can check that out and also get a sneak peek in my upcoming book, Why Catholics are, Can't Be Socialists. Well, can a Catholic be a socialist? The answer is no. Here's why. So help us make these. Please consider supporting us with a monthly gift at trendrunpodcast.com. It would be highly appreciated. And stay tuned. At least by early next week, I'll get to part two, maybe even part two, three, and four of my rebuttal to Pastor Mike Winger on his third video on the Catholic Church. So thank you all very much. Hope you have a very blessed day.